There are people here I've known for well over a quarter of a century. Helen was a member here. We were married here. I was pastor here for a few months. And I love you all. And out of your agony has come ecstasy. The decor is beautiful and modern and I feel out of place because I'm an antique. You know, it takes 5,000 able-bodied seamen to run an aircraft carrier. And it takes nearly as many as that to run a church. And for all you devoted church officers and volunteers, let me say thank you in general. Because if I did it individually, it would be time for the benediction. Did you each receive a copy of the sermon outline? Well, the last text is John 3, 14. I want you to make that 14 to 16. If you haven't got a pen, just remember. And take them home and uh, put them in a leather folder with golden lettering on it. This belongs to the immortal works of Keith Miller. I don't think you need to do that. At least gives you an idea what I'm trying to say. And when there are texts, I might quote them rather than read them. So they're there for you to check. I had a very good Catholic friend who used to come to church every time I preached. And once I looked up the text, he said, why do you do that? He said, I believe you. And he said, you interrupt my train of thought. So I'm not letting him dictate the homiletics of ministry, but because you have them there, I'll only look up the bare necessities. Just as a scriptural introduction, let me read from Romans 12, Romans 13, 11 and 12. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our, our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. Timely admonition. You would all be familiar with the famous quote of Ellen White, Testimonies 9, page 11. We are living in the time of the end. The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The words of Handel's oratorio resound with greater clarity than ever before. King of kings, Lord of lords, and he shall reign forever and ever. I'm an Australian by birth, I'm a Christian by choice, and I'm an Adventist by conviction. The story of the coming king is a solid Adventist doctrine. The picture of our world today is one of unprecedented crisis, immense catastrophe and overwhelming disorder. A remarkable aspect of this description is that it's not the impression of religious fanatics, but of sober scientists and calculating commentators. Scientists and commentators have assumed the role of heralds. They proclaim the end of the world as a distinct possibility. A modern writer has compared our time to an elephant hanging by his tail over a cliff 
with his tail tied to a daisy. Warring nations stretch from Beirut to Bangladesh, Iran to Istanbul, Afghanistan to Africa. There are trouble spots all over the world and man's plight worsens by population and pollution, economy and ecology, and politics and pestilence. The Bible begins with a story of creation made good and declared good by the Holy Creator. For he looked at his work and said, it is very good. Some times ago when I made something, I'd look at it and Helen would say to me, isn't this great Babylon that I have built? And I thought, oh, I shouldn't be looking. And then I remembered when God made the earth, he looked at it and he said, behold, it's very good. That was the end of that contentious issue. When we placed on this earth, we were given dimension, dom dominion over all of the earth. And man's prospect wasn't haunted by the possibility of pain. It needed no counterfoil of sorrow to highlight its joys. It was Adam's disobedience that initiated the turmoil. To talk about the end of the world is not to talk about the end of good but the end of evil and the reintroduction of good. Paul tells us that the whole creation groaneth for the redemption of the body. The second coming of Christ is an Adventist doctrine and we address that subject today as one of the greatest themes and the greatest certainties of the Bible. The topic harks back to Old Testament times and it figures largely in the New Testament. Today as never before, our despairing world needs a revival of the theme of Jesus' return. The doctrine of the Second Advent is the very keynote of the sacred scriptures Great Controversy 299. The doctrine of the second coming finds a larger place in the pages of Holy Writ than any other doctrine of the church. This glorious event being mentioned more than 300 times in the New Testament alone. If you say the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, you're an Adventist. The moment a man takes hold of the truth that Jesus is coming back to redeem his followers to himself, the world loses its attraction. And that was quoted by Dwight Moody. Today, as an Adventist preacher, I say, let's lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. What about the person? Is it he identified in Holy Scriptures? It was the Lord himself who promised the disciples, I will come again. It was Jesus himself under oath who declared to the high priest, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man coming in clouds and great glory. It was Jesus himself, the compassionate Saviour, that sent the angels to comfort those lonely disciples and assure them that the same Jesus would so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. This same Jesus, this same Jesus that walked and talked with them, the same Jesus who'd prayed with them, 
the same Jesus who had broken bread with them, the same Jesus who had been with them in the boat, who had on that very day ascended all of it with them, said, this same Jesus will come again. Jesus had to go to heaven to share his father's throne and the angels assured the disciples that the one who ascended, when they were looking up, would so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He went in bodily form and he will return in bodily form because the assurance is that the same Jesus will come back. When he comes back, he will sit on his throne of glory, which is what the Jews had expected when he introduced to them the throne of grace. They confused the two. After all, it looked like a contradiction because John the Baptist said, make way the way, make, make plain the way of the Lord. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jesus said, when he put the servant's ear back on, my kingdom is not of this world. Is that a contradiction? No, they were talking about two different kingdoms. And when he comes back, every eye shall see him. Christ came as a personal saviour to the world and he represented the personal God of his followers. He ascended on high as a personal saviour and he will come again as he ascended to heaven, a personal saviour. There is a text in scripture that makes all history meaningful and all future desirable. Hebrews 8, 28. For Christ was once offered, that makes history meaningful, to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him he shall appear the second time under salvation. That's the hope of the future. They thought, the Jews, that Jesus would establish a kingdom, overthrow the Romans, and set up his headquarters in Jerusalem. During his trial, that early Friday morning, Pilate asked him, oh, are you king then? And he said, yes, you said it. That's where we get the saying, you're telling me. The disciples after the resurrection, while Christ was preparing to leave the earth for the last time, asked, Lord, is this the time when you will establish the sovereignty of Israel? They still didn't get it. They didn't understand the kingdom of grace in which we are living now in anticipation of Christ's return when we who've been transformed by grace divine will be subjects of the kingdom of glory. Christ had repeatedly tried to make the people of his day understand that his kingdom of glory was not of this world at that time. Several of Jesus' parallels gave details about the makeup of his kingdom. The parable of the soul was about people, not property. The tares, the wedding, the virgins, all to do with the followers of Jesus, not inheritance of property. Yet it was not until after his ascension to heaven that the disciples realized what Jesus meant when he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Before leaving his disciples for the last time, Jesus once more explained the spiritual nature of his kingdom 
tarry in Jerusalem, he said, until you receive special out outpouring of Pentecostal power. They had a job to do, not an influence to inherit. The Apostle Paul understood the gospel of the kingdom to be not word but power. He realised that Christ came to this world the first time to establish the spiritual kingdom, not the physical one of glory. But he's coming back. Paul understood that the physical kingdom of the Old Testament prophecies must follow Christ's second coming. And he's coming back for spiritual Israel because he is not a Jew that is one outwardly, but if he be Christ's, then a Abram's seed. Paul cherished the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of Jesus, and that message was the faith that was once delivered to the saints, and it's being delivered to Adventist people again today. James, the brother of Jesus, wrote, Be patient and strong. The coming of the Lord is near. The Apostle John wrote, Behold, I come quickly, quoting Jesus' words. The early Christians believed beyond doubt that Jesus would return. They didn't look at a cleft in the ground called a grave, but a cleavage in the sky called glory. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now, if you know anything about English, there are positive, comparative, and superb, superb, superb. what is it? Superb. superb. I've got some money. Robert's got more money. And Doug up there's got most money. More is, a, I have made a positive statement. When I say Robert's got more, it's comparative, and the other is superlative. But we have a more sure word, that's comparison. What is it comparing? Even the eyewitnesses, they could be deceived, but the more sure word of prophecy said that Jesus is coming again. And he's coming again in glory. And a Hebrew prophet 500 years before Jesus wrote, There is a God in heaven that revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. And Nebuchadnezzar was given that great dream, and Daniel was given the responsibility to interpret. And it told of empires coming and going, and at last the footprints of the prophet can be seen in the ashes of empires. Because after Rome, there was no world empire. It divided into ten kingdoms. And in the days of those ten kingdoms of modern Europe, the Saviour will return. And then, in the vision of the beasts of, Revela of Daniel 7, we are given the assurance as a more sure word of prophecy that the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. The world powers came and have gone. The prophecy has been fulfilled. The kingdom of Christ's personal solution is the panacea for all of the world's ills. It's going to be an immortal kingdom. Its origin is without hands. Its duration is without end. 
Its control is without rival and its character is without sin. The coming day of the Lord. There is a New Testament text that is pregnant with warning, promise and admonition and we read it at the beginning. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. We're presently living in the grey of no man's land. We are between the passing of the night and the breaking of the day. The expression day of the Lord is used 18 times in the Old Testament and five in the New. Its usage by the prophets of old was primarily referring to the impending judgments on Judah. But the principle of the prophecy is that the prediction also applies to the final days of judgment to come upon the earth. The night is far spent. It must be the breaking of the day. Peter describes the end of time and the destruction of the earth. Such a time is for the punishment of the wicked, the salvation for the redeemed, a time of separation of the wheat and the tares, and a time of glad reunion. For in the execution of Christ's judgment, the angels will bear our loved ones together. Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment. And that judgment will be a day of separation and a day of reunion. The great separation will occur. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just. I don't like the word wicked. I'm wicked. You're wicked. I'd prefer to say the unsaved, but it's a terminology that we've got used to. The wicked look with terror and amazement upon the scene, while the righteous behold with solemn joy the tokens of their deliverance. Great Controversy 633. The night is far spent, the day of the Lord is at hand. That means the day of Jesus' return. That day is when the heavens will open and the trembling earth will yield up its dead. And that occurs at the time of his return. That day is when our vile bodies will be changed. That day is when Jesus leads the triumphant train of the redeemed on the long trek through the inky blackness of a million light years to the home of the saved. And that day is at hand. So once more into the breach, dear friends, we have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right a story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to the dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. When our first parents sinned, a blanket of darkness covered the earth and we who've been born since have been born into that darkness. We've never seen the face of Jesus. We live in a time when we see it's through a glass darkly. We've born in the dark. And so accustomed are we to that dark that they think, we think it is day. The night is almost gone. The day is coming on. It must be the breaking of the day. The mightiest empires of the world, Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome, have all come and gone. They've collapsed. 
But Seventh-day Adventists have always believed in the more sure word of prophecy. They've seen in the rise and fall of nations the finger of God pointing to the end of all human government and the second coming of Christ. Handel's Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forever and ever. We're in the twilight zone. We're in the toes, as it were, of Daniel's great image, the toes of time, the end of time. For Jesus is coming soon. The manner of his coming to those who love and serve Jesus are going to look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for him and he will save us because every eye shall see him. <coughs> the day of their final deliverance is at hand. It's almost time for the Lord to come. And then the kingdom and dominion under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, and all dominions will serve and obey him. Christ's purpose in atoning for the sins of men was that they might be with him forever. I have come, he said, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He eloquently entreated God, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. And we need to live for the same reasons that Christ died. Think about it. The cross of Christ has reopened the gates of heaven. The Bible teaches that man's entry to heaven is at the second coming. Jesus taught that his return would be visible because every eye will see him. He taught that it would be audible because he's coming with a shout, a trumpet sound, and the voice of an archangel. He's told us that it's going to be glorious because when he comes, he'll come in the glory of his own glorification, all the angels with him, and in the far glory of his Father. It's going to be personal, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. It's going to be up unexpected for that day and hour knoweth no man. Understanding the manner of Christ's return is very important because Jesus said, and he warned us, take heed, many shall come in my name. They'll prophesy in my name. And false Christs will come and appear. And if we don't know how Christ is coming, we'll see it on the screens in our lounge room. The Lord has come. But we know that will be a false Christ. That's why he warned us to know what it's going to be like. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. Great controversy, 625. The translation of the saints to heaven is often called the rapture. He's coming again to receive us. We'll be caught up to meet him in the air. His feet won't touch the earth. That'll be a rapture of the saints. Talks about a rever resurrection. Your dead shall be raised incorruptible. And they, with those who've been resurrected, will meet the Lord in the air. He's talking about the righteous going to heaven, and that's a rapture, but it's not silent. It's not secret. There'll be a triple pronouncement of Christ's arrival. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. He brought the world into existence with the voice of a creator. A voice of the archangel. And the dead in Christ shall rise. So it's the trump of God, the voice with a shout and the voice of the archangel. 
And that tells us that when Jesus comes, the dead will be raised. We will be given new bodies. Our corruptible will put on incorruption and we'll be taken to heaven. The rapture occurs when Jesus comes in all his glory. The dead are raised, the wicked are slain, and the righteous go to heaven. Talk about a secret rapture. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there are not two ways of salvation, one for the Jews and one for the church. Israel is the church. We're the spiritual Israel. There will be no one glorious return of Jesus for his church and another one for somebody else. And no secret event. Be ye also ready. By its very name, Adventist, this church claims to have the message of tr present truth. Noah had the message of truth for his day. Jonah had the message of truth for his day. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. That's not present truth for us to preach. We can draw spiritual lessons from us. John the Baptist had present truth. Prepare the way of the Lord. We have present truth. We are Adventists. It behoves us to bring it to other people's notice. Why? Because we are the last generation. The grey before the dawn. When this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world, that's Adventism. It's an international message for it's to every nation, kindred, tongue and people, and that's our commission. Raise your hands if English wasn't your first language. If you're first language, right. This gospel of the kingdom preached to all the world is a microcosm here. It's the everlasting gospel. It's to preach to people all around the world. The Adventist message is salvation and redemption to the world. And that's present truth because we're in the twilight hour before Christ's return. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Just look around your own congregation and see what a cosmopolitan group it is, which means the gospel has been preached to that country, to that country, and people have responded. And it doesn't matter if you're white or black or yellow or in between. We are all brethren. And we are candidates for the kingdom. We are trophies of Christ's grace and we've joined with Christ's remnant church. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, mine and yours, and he will appear the second time without sin under salvation. It's a life or death message. I dare not procrastinate. I cannot take it or leave it. I ignore it to my eternal peril. The devil knows that if people receive it fully, his power will be broken. In our natural sinful state, we are without hope beyond the grave. We're carnal, sold under sin, with nothing good in us. But there is more for the righteous because we have the blessed hope. We have this hope that shines within our hearts. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and Jesus will reconcile us to God, because we can claim his righteousness in place of ours. The whole transaction is summed us summed up for us by Ellen White in Steps to Christ. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your saviour, 
then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you were accounted righteousness. Christ's character stands in place of your character and you are accepted before God just as if you'd never sinned. Don't be afraid of the judgment. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left its crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Jesus' blood atones for everyone. If we confess our sins, that's our part, he will forgive us. That's his part. We have to surrender our will, repent of our waywardness, confess our guilt, and accept our Saviour, and then he'll do his part. He'll receive us unto himself. He'll forgive me of my transgressions, and not only will he forgive me, but he will cleanse me from all unrighteous and give me a likeness to his character. Then we become heirs of salvation, children of the King, forgiven sinners, justified before God. All this is the work of a moment. It's called justification. And if you have a sin that's troubling you now, in silent communion with your God, and he can read your mind, confess your faults to him now. The devil can't read your mind. You can be justified now in order to be glorified later. At the sounding of the trumpet when the saints are gathered home, we will greet each other by the crystal sea. When the Lord himself from heaven to his glory bids them come, what a gathering of the faithful that will be. The King of Glory is coming back. That's his promise. To receive me unto himself, that's my blessed hope. Then prophecies will be verified. Families will be unified. Saints will be glorified. Christ will be satisfied. The Father will be gratified. And finally, the earth will be beautified. Even so, come Lord Jesus.